How are you? Welcome to the Entrepreneur Experiment with me, Gary Fox. Today, we've got what I can only call a scoop. We've got Michael Corcoran, the ex-head of social at Ryanair, who left in explosive circumstances. We hear how he built one of the biggest social brands in the world, why he left, and what he does next. This is my talk with Michael Corcoran. Ever find yourself jumping from task to task, sudden eureka moments at the weirdest hours, and you forget little details? Does that sound familiar? That might be ADHD, and ADHD now are here to help. Their experienced clinical professionals conduct video consultations at your schedule and help you manage and understand these symptoms, turning them into your unique assets. Visit adhdnow.ie forward slash fox and use the code FOX10 at checkout for 10% discount on your initial consultation and full assessment. I'm building much more than a podcast with the Entrepreneur Experiment and have a very clear vision of what I'm trying to achieve. One of those goals was to get involved in funding Irish businesses, and I've just achieved that goal. I've joined the Quintus Capital team as a special advisor to the EIS Innovation Fund. I spent the last couple of years getting to know the team, learning about the industry, and the time has come to join forces. The EIS Innovation Fund has invested in several of the podcast guests you know and love already, such as Matthew and Katie from Squid and Peggy Crowley of Brown Wellbeing, which has made the decision to join the fund a really, really simple one. EIS Tax Relief provides significant tax refunds to investors who back Irish SMEs. However, the main issue with EIS is finding the right companies to invest in. This is where the EIS Innovation Fund comes in. It is an experienced management team to allocate your capital. They're now raising capital for November and December to deploy in 2024. If you are interested in becoming an investor, please visit EIS.fund, so EIS.fund, or download a copy of the online brochure in the show notes. I've got a massive ambition for this podcast. I want to make this the number one business podcast in the world. If I'm going to do that, I've got to be world-class on every single level. And that includes having a world-class studio, which I now have at Iconic Offices, The Green Room. It's an incredible space. I first recorded here with my live pod back in June, and I loved it. And get this, it's publicly bookable. That means you can go online and book it right now. As I said... It's called The Green Room. It's a private cinema and screening room. That means it's perfect to wow a client with a pitch, host a private screening, or do what I do, record a podcast here. So as I record here, and as you know, I'm a member of Iconic Offices, I've got the team at Iconic Offices to hook us up with a number of exclusive complimentary office trials and discounts for my audience for booking this exact space. No catches. Simply go to the web link in the description, grab the offer that works best for you. Thanks, Iconic Offices. Michael, welcome to the pod. Let me fix myself up because you have this on camera and I'm not the most pleasant on camera, Gary. I've always wanted to say this. What a scoop. What a scoop. What a scoop. Oh, the tea is being spilt everywhere. We don't know what's going on, but something's happening. You have somebody who's not even a founder, who doesn't have a pot to piss in in his life talking on an entrepreneur podcast. Why the fuck am I here, Gary? But you're, we'll, we'll figure that out. It'll all reveal itself over the course of the next hour. But you're a managing partner now. I am. It's a wanky term, but we had to give something to... Uh, something for partners. the LinkedIn, right? Yeah, something for the LinkedIn, but even at that, I'm going to take the piss out of myself. <laughs> what were you doing before? You were a managing partner, Michael. Um, again, I'm in a bit of an echo chamber, so like I'm getting my ego massaged and rubbed way too much over the last couple of years. I am or have been the head of Ryanair social media and content for about two and a half years. Um, I came in there in about July 2021, off the back of some interesting career movements. Um, another one is after happening too, but um, yeah, I was given the responsibility of putting a strategy together for Ryanair that could work in the space. Um, assembling a team of misfits, which I did, a beautiful bunch of human beings, and try and make Ryanair famous on the internet. Um, well, fucking mission accomplished there. So people say, but again, I'm my typical self. We live in this marketing echo chamber that I'm getting a lot of compliments from, but there were signals outside of what is good social media marketing um, that it it. it carry through and cut through to actual real people who talk about it all the time and uh, yeah I, th I think it worked well why we're here not to massage ego further is we were at Ecom Live together last year mm. and you were on just after me I warmed them up for you then you came on and finished the deal what do you call them fluffers is it Gary <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to use the term but then uh, there you go there, I will, I you can say whatever you want <laughs> I mean, there's no PC with me <laughs> 
<laughs> so I normally, and I said this to you earlier, I normally would just like bolt. I'd, it'd be over. But I was like, this could be pretty good. I'll hang around. And it really bloody was. Not to massage your ego even more, but it was a bloody brilliant talk. We'll get to the topic of that talk mm. in a minute. You mentioned before you were in Ryanair. What were you doing? So I would have been agency side for in a couple of agencies in the company of Huskies who are now absolutely blown out of the water. And like I'm so proud of the work that they've done. But I, I started my career there. They gave me my shot. Um, and I came in actually on, on an internship. And within four weeks, they offered me a full-time role because they, they saw something in it. Uh, John Forrest, MD there, who's been a great and huge, great people. I was there for about three or four years. But um, I, I decided I needed to, to take a step up. And there was, again, I wasn't getting the growth opportunity, also the financial opportunity. So I went looking elsewhere. Um, I took on a role then with 8020, which was an independent agency here as well. But they got bought minority by WPP. Um, Dave Connor would have founded that and set that up many moons ago. Worked there on some great accounts like Aldi, uh, Guinness Storehouse, Opal, and many, many others. But um, during that transition, I found it an interesting thing because when I went back to Huskies and I told them I got an offer, the first thing Jonathan said was, Congratulations. And he said, if there's one piece of advice that I'd always give you is always know your market value. Um, and I found that fantastic. He, he was so transparent and so honest, knowing that we know your potential. We can give you that growth and development here, but we can't monetize that right now because we're in a period of growth. And he was very clear on what that was, that we can't increase your salary. Level. But here's where we can go. We, I probably know that's not going to match what you've got. Um, but that's at least that I have. I eventually got the decision where I left. But... You know, between that advice, it kind of really set me up for success. And when I did navigate my career, and even when I installed the people I manage and the people I talk about, as I always tell them, always know your market value. Always know in business, it's business. Mm -hmm. you're, still, you're still an employee at the end of the day, and there's always going to be something out there where people will hold a better value for what you provide. The other thing, like, what caused it as well is, there's two kind of things that drive your satisfaction, especially in work. And this is strange because like entrepreneurism is quite different. But again, I'm talking as, I guess, go, climbing the corporate ladder. There's two things that kind of motivate you in work. It, it's, it's growth and it's money. And it's almost like a scale. If you're getting good growth, but you're not earning enough, you know there's satisfaction that this is going to provide the opportunity for my next step, so I'll sit tight. If you provide money, but you know it's a solid job, but there's no growth or there's no development, it's okay because after my working hours, I have a pretty good life. If one of those outweigh the other, there's a nice decision to be made. So you can stay there longer. You understand that there's a value transaction there. But if both of them down, big red flag, it's time to go. And it was kind of like that at the moment in what I thought was, where in my first role, that I wasn't getting the growth potential and I wasn't getting the money and I needed to, to, to make a decision. And it was at that time when I weighed those up, up those options and used that scale as a, as a metric. It was the right thing to do. But went to 8020 for a number of years, worked there. And once I was finished agency side and been whipped by every brand that possibly can because that's what agencies are there for, I moved in-house and I went to the to the wonderful world of Paddy Power Betfair. Now, whenever I mention that, people think, oh, you're the guy behind Paddy Power. No, I'm not. I'll never take credit for that. Michal Nagel is the guy behind Paddy's Power Social, head of social, and he should take the credit. So if anybody ever listens, I try to clarify that and rectify that. It's just the name of the business at the time was Paddy Power Betfair. That came first. I would have managed the Betfair brand. It was more of a, a premium betting brand, more dominant in the UK market, and it was the innovator of building the Betfair exchange. I would have worked there for about three years or so, um, again, trying to define and improve their social media. But that came with really interesting challenges too, both in, in identifying what that was in the shadows of Paddy Power, who were doing such exceptional work on social media, um, and finding out their why. Um, didn't come to the fruition that I, I would have hoped. Did we do some great work? Yes, we had a lot of budget, a lot of investment, created lots and lots of content, but there was some great learnings in that experience of what not to do when it came to actually winning in this space. Long story short, then I got to a stage where um, there was a big reorg in, in Flutter and sadly I was one of, one of the people who uh, were, were put on the list of people to go because there was a global setup. They needed to break it down into different markets. So anybody working in the global world were no longer null and void and they were merging roles into two. Brand and social came together. Uh, I'm a social guy. I've done social media since day dot. I'm, I Do I understand the theory of marketing and branding? I do. I apply it in everything that I do every day. But... I knew I only had 20% of what that role was. They still encouraged I went for it. And I said, you guys are laughing. I know you're, we're just going through the motions here. But the guy beside me, who's, who, who's my colleague, 
is far better suitable to that fucking role than I will ever be. So I went, okay, I, I'll, I'll go to the motions, but I knew what the answer was. Eventually stepped out. We're getting there. We're getting there. Pause for one second. You said you learned not what to do. I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes. I want Love you to explain what not to do, but go on ahead. Great. Uh, last piece of the puzzle then is I had no work. I was given a nice little uh, golden handshake to go out the door and I went, what next? Euro 2020 came to town. So I went and worked with UEFA for a small stint, uh, which is one that I don't speak about actually a lot because it wasn't the tr- purest traditional social role. If all honesty, it was great for the CV. What were you doing? I was a, a fan a communications coordinator. Fancy. So that would have been all the comments that was pushed through the Euro 2020 app around going to the games. I was responsible for the execution of that within the Dublin legs of the game. But long story short there, COVID happened, we lost the matches, it went out. But because I had such a good experience and I did it so well, they kept me on for the remainder of the tournament working remotely, which was a fantastic thing to Unreal. do at that time. So Class. It was Especially great. Especially if you're a sports fan. Oh, big time, definitely. And it was, it was a great experience. Um, not directly connected to what I was doing purest in social media for many many years but it's always one I forget about and the, like when you talk about it Euro 2020 is one of the biggest footballing events around the world yeah. but yeah why don't you ever remind people that you actually worked there for 8 months when that was done I went to look for a next option um, I saw a Ryanair gig come up it said you have a carte blanche responsibility of transforming Ryanair social media I got interviewed it took 30 minutes to do the interview and I got the offer the next day what did you say? I, I don't know really. I, I again, what appealed to me in the in the conversation was the lack thereof of bullshit, um, and we had a very frank on conversation on on what was done. My CV was my CV. I didn't really want need to talk about it. You can read that. Um, I explained why I liked the business. I explained what I, why I wanted to work there. I felt that it was an opportunity for me to work in an environment that culturally, or so I thought, was right. Um, and I got I got the gig. And within six months... What was their social at the time? Because I think only people listening will remember what it is now. But what was it at the time? Like, again, they've always been okay at it. Like, it was, it was took a while for them to evolve it. There was peppers of, of winnable moments that got them attention. The tone of voice was kind of always there. But I think when COVID happened, the team got kind of broken apart. Like, when travel wasn't happening you couldn't really communicate about travel and what they were doing was quite a, a mix mash fragmented chaotic trying to be like what other airlines were on the internet with a little bit of dabble of humour put in so there was sparks of the potential of a success um, but there was no clear strategy behind it and no clear process or plan behind it either and I literally took that and I supercharged it now the other thing I can't take credit for which again I'm very honest is I didn't make Ryanair TikTok what it is today. Did I take it over and help accelerate it more? To an extent. But the team beforehand, um, Andrew Mython is his name, um, and Lily Rafferty, who was there for about a year of my time, were the people who were the, the main drivers of what success that most people would be the original reference point to Ryanair Social before it kind of blew up everywhere else. Um, I think during COVID they had a, an opportunity because TikTok became this comfort blanket for everybody on the internet. It was this place where, you know, everyone was so sick of this fake filter nature of social media that, you know, they wanted realism. And TikTok became the space where it was. And it's predominantly driven by the Gen Z um, demographic because they're sick of fake shit on the internet and they want to be real and honest about things. They want to be self-deprecating. And even the traumas that they live through and the traumas to the world, um, they use dark humor as a way to, you know, navigate that. And TikTok became this place for it. And at the time, because Ryanair couldn't talk about travel, they just let the team have a go to test and learn, do do and fail things fast and the things that most other corporate brands are still only trying to figure out now. And they got an opportunity. They got out there fast and the rest was history for them. What was your strategy? What did you go in and say? Right, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, mine? The, well, there wasn't. There was a lot of observation at first. And look, when it comes to strategy, I try to put a bit of shape and a framework. And again, essentially what I'll do going forward in, in my career next is I need to understand the why. I need to find what is the opportunity. And that's built on kind of four variables. You've got brand, category, customer, and the social media landscape. And from that, you start to build the information, build the insight. What is ownable or what is unique to the brand? From a category point of view, what is happening in the category that everybody's doing that you might find a point of difference to do different on the internet? Customer, what are the customer's motivations, needs, wants, or problems that you need to try and solve? And the last one, well, 
what do people look for when it comes to content on the internet? What is the current landscape like? How is it going to evolve? And it's finding intersections and points on that that then makes the best informed decision. And when you start to find that, you then identify your why. You can see what that is, how it can do something for the brand or business, and how you can have impact. And more importantly is, you start to make decisions on what not to do. Mm -hmm. Because we always talk about strategy as a way of what to do. But strategy is also about sacrifice. It's about making decisions about what not to do. And the biggest problem most corporate brands and people have when it comes to using these platforms, which are already so chaotic and so fragmented, is it becomes this big fucking dumping ground of shit for everyone. And it's just every person wants a tick box on their PowerPoints to say that they've delivered on their campaigns or messaging by just sticking it on social media. And that's the first problem because you not only do you need to compete with people on the internet, you're competing against other people within your business with other messaging and it's completely cannibalizing you before you even think about how you compete with other people. That's a lot. It is. I can talk a lot too. <laughs> how do you c- translate that into what you did? So... If I can, I can try to distill it. Like the main brand insight that came for us was Ryanair democratized travel. Back in 1985, Ryanair came to the market and completely flipped the script. Travel was a luxury back then. Anybody trying to travel would pay an arm and a leg and it wasn't a commodity. It wasn't accessible to all. Ryanair came and changed. Say, let's take flights from London to Dublin by British Airways or, or Aer Lingus, our national carrier. Um, it was about £300 at the time. Ryanair came in 50 quid. Everybody got to travel and see the world. They disrupted the category and then they disrupted it through their marketing. Again, I will not take credit for something that was already being done so well previous. The CEO himself, Michael O'Leary, knew that low-cost, high-reach marketing was a very effective way to build awareness for the brand, but you had to do it in a way that was disruptive. And he lived and died that and still to this day does it, mm-hmm. for good or for bad. And it was in our DNA. So knowing that that was something that was associated with us, but not everybody knew it was associated with us because you've got demographics who wouldn't know of Michael O'Leary or wouldn't have experienced it, but they were the two kind of main things. We knew that we were disruptors. We can be polarizing as a brand because we've done it from day one and we can polarize in what we say and what we do and it's of nothing new. Second then is in the category. Everyone is doing the same thing when it comes to communication. They're selling these fake filtered experiences, beautiful pictures of cabin crew, these destination shots all the time and it's all aspirational. Um, And... Yeah, it's going to deliver some sort of reach and engagement, but it's modest. And by doing the same thing, you're going to fail. It's just jumping into the sea of sameness, this vanilla corporate bullshit that corporate brands have been doing for many, many years, thinking that that's the right thing. So then we go to the customer. The biggest insight for the customer was passengers' expectations are too high when it comes to traveling low cost. And that's played out predominantly on social media. There's first world problems. There's luxuries that they think that they can expect for getting a 10-year flight to the UK. Um, And the problem wasn't necessarily with the boomers. Why does that persist? Who knows? Silver spoons. The Celtic tiger babies is what I think it is. It's the, the boomers don't have a problem. We democratize travel. They knew about that. And they're okay with the things that they're... Because they knew what it was like. They they, knew it was going to be 400 quid and now it's 40. Happy days. Get on, be quiet. There's things I'm not going to get when I would pay for 400 quid, but that's okay because I pay 40 quid to get from Dublin to Malaga, single fare. Then you've got the young generation who are tech savvy, who know it, who are very cost sensitive, who just want experiences to do crazy shit. They can go on a flight to Italy and have a pizza and come back the same day for 20 quid. Why? Because they fucking can. You have the silver spoon millennials, the jackasses like me, all my friends who think, who expect luxury across everything because we're so fucking privileged that their expectations are too high and they complain and complain and complain and complain all the time even though they they paid fuck all for their for their ticket and there was a big problem we had to change because most of that moaning and those first world problems were being played out on social media first before everywhere else and not only on social but then in in the conversations they were having with their friends and peers and we needed to do something about that the last one then is the landscape the two main motivations and I will not ignore this and I, I, I won't and unless you're talking about pay campaigns which is paid advertising which is different I'll talk about like the organic opportunity even I hate using that fucking word is the two main motivations people go to social media at the moment one is to be entertained and two is to escape from the shit show that's going on in their day to day lives and other than that if you don't cater to those first you're losing a battle straight away Again, so everything you need to wrap around in is in that. And even at that, though, that escapism is small pockets of opportunities where somebody is working a 12-hour shift and they're very f- busy. Um, 
it's it's probably not the most aspirational or enjoyable job. And I'm talking about the majority here. They go to the toilet. They're spending five minutes on the toilet. On, on the, they are on their commute. They're spending 30 minutes on their bed. It's small pockets of active consumption, but yet so much content by the category, by everyone has been created that is very passive and doesn't meet the needs, wants or motivations that people look for on social. And you then try to create that content that is just not working. And then you've got to match it between content that other creators are making, that is fun, entertaining, engaging. The other shite that then your sister's putting up that she had brunch and in a bar with bottomless mimosas. Your granny's putting up a picture of her dog after walking. And all this you're competing with. And if you don't understand the basic needs and wants and motivations of social media, you're going to bloody lose. So by putting all those together, we looked at, okay, who's doing a really good job? Creators. What is appealing to people? Entertainment driven content, talking about the shit that's going on in the world in a way that is self deprecating. And it's done in a way that isn't polished. Fantastic. So let's think and act like a creator. And then how does that work for us? Well, we are a low cost airline. We don't over invest in marketing. We're not premium. We don't position ourselves to be. And we've got a polarizing tone of voice. Handshake, perfect match. We can now do this very easily. How does it work against our competitors? Well, we're not doing premium content talking about experiences. We're talking about the problems in the point of view of passengers and people that be, makes it more relatable and less aspirational. Uh, and the final piece is within that content and messaging, we are finding ways to change the perception around traveling low cost by leaning in so much on ourselves and the, and the product and the process by leaning into the first world problems. We're almost making it aware that we know the experiences you have. But that's the product. Get over it. You're, it's a point to point airline, a bloody good one at that. And all you're paying for is getting from A to B as close to on time as possibly can for sweet fuck all. And we leaned in on that and we, they basically what we then with all that insight, we, we created an, an articulation of a, of a strate- strategy. And that strategy was... Because cr- what you're saying there is very fucking simple, but not easy. But that strategy... So if it was that easy, everyone would be doing but that's, it. Well, it. But that strategy... It's going to the point of finding where the opportunity lies and trying to articulate then what that is in the best way possible. And then putting a set of guiding principles together about where you are now to where you need to get to next. Not necessarily hard and fast rules, but but navigation points that allows you to have consistency and focus to try and get you moving along, to have impact and to do something that actually could work. And even like... Not all strategy is perfect either, like, but at least it's a set of decisions of what, what to do and what not to do and how to get there. So that was your strategy. Execution, how? Execution. So we did a creator-led approach. So we, we acted and behaved like a creator on the internet. And we had two levers that did it. One was to be relatable and topical when it comes to what's happening in the world and being a voice. And that translated from what we were doing in the past. Our CEO talking about the things that are going in the world in a provocative way but it was still entertainment. And then delivering always on content that changed the perception of traveling low cost. And w- what we did was we called it like a jab, jab, hook approach. That every time we hit a jab with reactive content that, again, I don't want to use the word, that got traction, generated PR, the V word, viral, millions of impressions. It created a window of opportunity for us. Yes, at the very basic principles of marketing, we created mental availability, awareness of the brand. Ryanair, Ryanair, Ryanair. And if you can do that, that's half the battle of marketing. Um, we then also, in that opportunity, like again, I'm not going to say I know how the algorithms work because that's bullshit. Nobody knows. Not even the algorithms know themselves. The computers don't even, you know, they're teaching themselves. But what I can have a fair assumption on is that when a piece of content goes viral, you reach a lot of low engaged users. And there's an opportunity where if you engage with that content, you're sending some sort of signal to the machine that you like this content. So they're either going to share more of the content from the same account or similar content from that same niche or area to see do you like more of it. And if you continuously engage with it, you're on to a winner. So with that jab, jab, hope approach, like when we hit people with the reactive content, we knew we had a small window to re-engage them. So we need to make sure that the rest of our content are always on, let's call it. The really important message perception change in content. What do you mean by always on? What does that mean? Always on is, is pre-planned content. So always on is content that is pre-planned that is, is, is ran on a daily basis. So it's planned, it's coordinated, there's a process to it, there's a frequency to it. Like We're, what? Like what? So it's we would have delivered video content across, say, a, a working week. We deliver 10 pieces of video content across a number of channels. And in that is a specific set of messages that changed 
um, perception around first world problems that uh, helped uh, generate awareness of the low cost model that tapped into relatable moments around traveling and traveling low cost and traveling in the air. And in that, we baked in messaging about the plan, the process, the carry to change the mindset of traveling with low cost. So always on is that frequent messaging that you need to deliver creatively with repetition that allowed to change a mindset. Um, whereas reactive is impulsive. It's off the cuff. It's never planned because you're spotting moments to actually add, execute on. And these are probably the moments people are thinking of right now. That's the moments people are living. But, but funny enough, the always on is the stuff that has really shifted the dial. Yes, people are aware uh, of us for being an entertaining brand. But the pain points are the areas where they want or where we wanted people to hate Ryanair less. It's the always on content that has been a real game changer on that. And we took average impressions and views from what was an average week of 5 million people, which is a lot for a brand without spending on media, up to an average 30 million per week. We delivered about 2 billion impressions over an 18 month period without putting our hands in our pocket on paid media. 2 billion, let's just emphasize that, 2 billion two organic billion. reach, or, not paid. Not paid. Now that's excluding, that's only what we can quantify on the dashboards on the channels that we manage. That's not including any of the articles written or the publicity driven by media on the back of the content we made, and there was a lot. Uh, the screenshots and the using of our content by meme accounts, the likes in the UK, the Archbishop of Banterbury, the British memes, who have millions and millions of followers, who countless times took our content and published it. If you use the old wanky PR metric of, you know, uh, a mention or an image on a piece of editorial is worth three times the ad value or three times the reach. You take the two billion and multiply that by three. That's potentially, again, I'm not going to say that's what we did, but the impact that it had and the amount of people it reached. That's like mental. And I think it's important. That's when I was listening to your talk, I was like, holy shit. Because mm. people don't really understand the scale of what you were doing. Mm. With a team of seven people, all done in house by ourselves. But what was important to that? It was navigating, it was finding the right people to execute in the strategy. It was putting the plans and processes in place. It was creating the creative playgrounds to unearth and train and condition to those moments of success that we got. Because they weren't one-off moments. They were, sometimes there were moments of luck and things mixed up. But that was off the back of conditioning, repetition, training, finding efficiencies, building processes in place to make sure that we can maximize our time and our ability to make sure that we are always on the clock when it comes to reactive, but we're still delivering a high frequency and threshold of always on content that was meeting every time we hit those moments. And both of them working side by side led to the growth impression of two billion. Like it's so rare to do that, I think. Consistently. All right, people can go viral once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, lightning can strike. But to do it consistently. You build a you build a reputation for it though. And that's what what came off the back of it as well. We built a reputation for when something happened in the world. Who is going to be talking about this in an entertaining way? So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. People would come and go, what are they going to say next? Pretty much, and they were waiting. Right. Uh, and also, because they were engaging so much, there was a higher chance we were being served faster. Then there's also our timing. Like, our timing and our speed of reacting was incredibly important. And timing, even if an idea is half good, or uh, a funny interaction to a moment that's happening in the world is, you know, average. First to market is always... Uh, really really important in the world of social because you know you'll get the early engagement that carries and you'll break through then and reach more people the the low engaged users and start appearing those fees and it takes off even further and further so like there's so many things that you can break down in detail about how we did it um but timing having the team set up to be operating in a specific way to make sure that we ha always had somebody one eye on the pulse and then we also had a, a very lean and smart operation to producing high volume content. Like we were delivering maybe, I'd say it's about 60 pieces of, of pre-planned content every week. And that's including a lot of video. And that takes time to mm. concept, to produce, to plan was still delivering in the world of reactive and being on the clock all the time. That sounds like a mountain of work, especially for a small team like that. How it are you is, managing it? It is, but like we broke it into two two tribes or two squads, whatever language you want to use. One was reactive and community. It did what it said in the tin. They were the news checkers. And the agreement was that in each tribe, 50% of your time was dedicated specifically to that, that discipline. 
So we made sure there was like four and four. Even myself, I, I got involved in the early stages because I had to teach and coach about how to do it. Like, again, these were people who were coming in quite raw. Um, and I, basically the 50% of the time was on it, but you had then four people with, in each team. So whilst they were, might have been working on other projects or doing other things, we always had people on the clock for reactive. We then did discovery work. So we always had like two discovery moments every every day. We had an AM check and a PM check where we use Twitter, we use Reddit, and we use other touch points to find what's happening out there in the internet. We compiled it, we shortlisted it, and we then put it into a working group where we started then ideate on the go. In that, that person who was in discovery should at least have starter ideas or starter for tens on those concepts to make us move faster or even go yes, no, and fast track the decision making. And in each moment... So you're trying to find something just on the cusp of going viral? Just on the cusp of going viral. And then you're trying to put your spin on it. So you have someone always watching Correct. going here, right, here's our top five. This is what's bubbling. This is what I think will yeah. bubble. And this is what I think we could do with it. Correct. And if there's a starter <laughs> idea, which means we can move faster. If not, well, then we put it in, we put five minutes on the clock. And again, five minutes on the clock. If you don't have an idea that we feel meets the criteria. So you're in a meeting room. What are you doing? It's not in a meeting room. It's, it's all in chat or around our desks. Unreal. Um, five minutes on the clock. Five go. minutes on the clock. And it's literally we tissue. And if it's if we can make it in five minutes, even better. If we can't make it, we'll allow a little bit more time if we think it's a runner. And then we go. If it's past five minutes and we're over engineer, overthinking, it's not going to work. We miss the moment. Next play. We move on. And we did that kind of two core checks every day. Uh, AM and PM but in the day we would have then obviously things we keep an eye on things we know might happen things that happen during a, a day that we know take like Prime Minister's questions in the UK where we knew Wednesday at 12 o'clock Sky News is on we're always watching that because normally something really golden comes from there and especially when Boris Johnson and Liz Truss was in, in as Prime Ministers at that working time it was just absolute content gold and we knew public affairs was an open game for us because everybody loves talking about it everyone loves shitting over it, and we absolutely tore the arse and you're always punching up Correct. Always punching up. So then we go to the other side, which is always on. The other half of the team, same. 50% of their time was dedicated to pr production of always on content. So we, 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 we reach a threshold where we needed to meet, say, um, 10 pieces of video creative that were reels, ticked, or well, well, reels and uh, friendly and YouTube shorts. So portrait video, contextual entertainment, almost pre-planned sketch comedy, which is also jumping into more responsive not reactive trends, things that were, that were happening at the moment where there was a trending sound or a trending moment or a trending thing on the internet and we put our spin on it. And then there was kind of pre-scripted ideas, comedy and sketches within our content that became video memes. Then we looked at static as well. So we made sure that we weren't only catering the video, but we were catering to static, so the meme worlds and tapping in and finding relatable moments. Again, finding captioned images that were relevant at that moment in time or things that we knew that would be able to articulate a message that was important for us. And we did like, 10, 10 of those. Why 10? We just agreed that at, based on time, resource and budget, we had to reach a certain frequency of that. Now, that takes a lot of time to ideate, create and make at the same time. Um, so whilst the content looks lo-fi and purposely looks lo-fi, um, it still takes time. But what we ended up doing, we started to create a method. We said, we'll go with 10 first. Um, funny enough, on a, on a different podcast, I said there was no science to this, but they said, when you explain it, there is a fucking science to it. Uh, Everything you do is a clear system in science. Yeah. Like this, this sounds like you're part comedian, part CEO, part MBA, part everything. Like you're just art and science blend. I, I, but again, no matter what I do, if I make coffee, if I mucked out sheds on a farm, I'd still probably be the same. I'd be relentless, curious, and I, I just try and do my best. But when it came to the always on, we said, well, what's a threshold? Let's look, let's try 10 pieces of creative. So we said, we need to make sure as a team in the always on tribe, you need to deliver 10 pieces of video creative and 10 pieces of static creative the Friday in advance of the following week. However we get there, that's your target. So we started to go through, it took weeks and weeks, failed, missed the deadlines, missed the deadlines. Okay, again, this is a new team. So you're looking ahead, week ahead, week ahead. this is what's going to happen, uh, our England are playing whoever, and, we're and going to have an announcement, there's an election, blah, 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 uh, blah, exactly. blah. Exactly, and map. even just pain points, and uh, it's just relatable content to to the travel model, to the low-cost uh, low cost experience, tapping into those moments, people complaining on the stairwell, why the fuck are we standing on the stairwell? Well, let's make a joke out of that, but explain why at the same time. So all that content was done in advance. So they were working on and we built processes around from concept to, to production, to edit, to review, to approve. And the aim was to have those 10 pieces of, or let's say 20, the static in the videos done one week in advance. We eventually got to that. It took, took a long time to get there. And we got there. And then we started to look, okay, what was good? What was sticky? We tested, learned, we iterated the creative. We let the audience decide what was good and what was not. And we hit a threshold. We said, right, 100,000 video views. Again, people laugh, 100,000 video views. If I got that for any piece of content, we, we'd be promoted, bonuses everywhere, but that to us was, a, was our benchmark, our, our, our foundation. 
So once we hit that, we saw that, okay, we take that content and we put it into what's called a banger bank because this is another misconception with social media. And there's this old age thing created by agencies for so many years and it just pisses me off that they feel you have to be 24-7 on social media to deliver wins. Yes, to an extent, if, if an organic play is, is what you're doing. But the production of content equals money. And that's what content agencies and agencies have been doing for ages. And they've been creating this falsehood that this is, only, this is the only way you can win on social. But it's not. That's another tangent I can go on. But essentially what we got to was that we wanted to create enough content that was hitting the mark that was sticky. And we then, once it was sticky and it was reaching a threshold of performance, we put it into a banger bank because we knew we could use it again and we knew it was good. Now, I'll tell you why, and I'll give you a great example. I it was you that opened my eyes to this. You were the first person and, I heard say this. And I love this as well because it like this again. If you went to a, a brand or if you went to an, an, uh, or an agency came and said, we need 250 grand to make a TV ad. Okay, that sounds about right what it costs to make a TV ad. But we're only going to air it once on TV and it'll never be seen again. What the fuck are you talking about? Like marketing needs to be run with frequency. You need to s- deliver that message numerous of times to people so they can get recall, either remember the message, remember the brand, or have some sort of connection or, 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 or remember what you're trying to say. But yet for some reason on social media, oh, let's make a monthly calendar with 30 pieces of content. Let's put it out there, but let's never use it again because it's 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 not fresh enough. It's all just out of date. Bollocks. As if everyone is just waiting to see your piece, your one piece you're going to put out that, that day. Nobody sees. And you said like the algorithm. Jesus, sometimes the algorithm doesn't serve it. It serves but it, it to the wrong most it doesn't, thing. It, the, or it's testing. Because it. it doesn't even meet the mark. It's not yeah. like it's, it's shit content. It's a price point in a fucking product. But where I'm getting to is we eventually then when we delivered, we, we created the system. We started to get ahead. We started to build the always on system. And then we were happy enough that the bank was full enough. We then started to bring the bank back into our weekly planning. So rather than making 10 new pieces, we made eight and took two from the bank and put it into the mix and send it again. Uh, and we started to improve. As that grew, the number of views grew on that content yet again. So our threshold went up. We hit a threshold of 150,000 video views. Then we went great. We tested, we were continuously learning and testing the creative and we were continuously building the bank. Then we got to a point where we were making eight or six videos and putting in four. Then we were getting down to four and then putting in. Now we could focus on quantity or quality, not quantity. And our creative was getting better. Our ideas were getting better. And then we started conditioning and we had this bank and we were cycling content all the time. Every Because people think it's one or the other. Oh, I just have to lash it out or I'm going to do one unbelievable one thing a week. Can't can't be one or the other. No. And and this is only one side of how to do social, by the way. And like a big thing for me is like, Ryan Air the exception of what, what social media was, both their tone and how they deliver. But it's not the norm. But it's not also the only way to deliver. We took a very kind of media publisher, content creator approach. That was the strategy, strategic decision. But there's plenty of brands that don't even need to touch that at all. Not even do organic at all. They could do pure play. They could do influencer. There's so many ways to be on social without being on social in the traditional sense. But we set up the teams to deliver that and we created the vehicle. So now it looks like, okay, so you created a system now that became more leaner, more efficient, reusing content, making the content better, QAing it, improving it. And this cycle happened. This beast became a thing and it became on autopilot. So then not only did we focus on the quality of less video content we were making, it freed up our time then to look at what are the other things we can win within social. And it became more efficient and we're using our time better. And the two of them working together created the beast that we did. And then what happened? And then they go and spoil it all by saying something stupid like... Um, what happened? Great question. Um, where do I start? Off the back of the good work we were doing at Ryanair, I got asked that I want to take on a more expanded role in taking over the creative department. And I said, this is a great opportunity because I set myself a deadline of two years that I, I need to make this work where I'm no longer needed. And that's a success for me because it pushes me to take my next step because I was head of social for nearly six or seven years across different different roles and different remits. I, I reached my ceiling there. and I needed something else. I need to expand. So you said two years, I'm going to be gone out of the head of social role into what? Something, either in there something. or elsewhere. Right, but okay. That was my, July 2023 was my target. Wasn't far off it. Um, and I made a commitment to the per- the senior person I hired as well. I said, my job is to put you in my seat in, in a year's time. I said, if, if you come and commit, I will get you there. I got her, got her there in January 2023. 
where I then took on a wider remit. I tried to then reshape the creative department. Uh, what's the diff- what's creative department? I suppose, so social. in in house design studio. So video production. They would have designed all the emails, all the internal comms, all the inter- gotcha. all, all the own channel work, the the branding, the airport branding, all of that. We had a studio of about sixteen people. I took on that and it became almost I think 17, 18 or nineteen people, and we're still hiring at the time. But at that time, I said, look, I'll take this on. I have no problem. This is a great growth role for me. This is me expanding creativity. I thought that there was a, a bigger opportunity then for Ryanair to take what we learned and what we did in social media and bring it through all the marketing, which the business were actually buying into. However, I made a comment at that time, but I can only do it if I see a change in how our our boss, our director, was engaging and behaving and communicating to the team, which I felt was an unacceptable way. And I got commitment at the time that I would see changes. I said, fine. But I said, if there wasn't, there was going to be a problem at some point. I won't be sticking around. Long story short, we got to a point where an incident happened where one of my team was impacted and I just couldn't stand over it anymore. Uh, So I decided to take it further. And I then resigned because I wasn't happy with the process of how it happened. And I wasn't convinced in the changes that were being said were going to happen. There was the word saying that change will happen without articulating what that change is. And there wasn't enough substance in that uh, in that for me to change. So I resigned and then within 24 hours, I was given the beautiful letter to go on gardening leave. And here I am. So I officially finished um, after three months gardening leave. Obviously I couldn't say, do anything, work with anybody, but I had plenty of time to talk to lots of people about what next. Um, I thought I'd make that decision in two weeks time or in two weeks after I, I, I left uh, on gardening leave. But the amount of of calls, curiosity, desire to work, was you're very good at what you do. Was my you're, a, you're able to just peek, just just a little. Well, like I kind of knew, like, and again, it, without being too arrogant, the reason why I stepped forward and I couldn't stand over the behavior anymore, and why I did it is, I knew I had nothing to lose. I knew we built a bit of a beast within the industry that created a very good reputation for myself and my team mm. because it was the team. We all did the work and I knew that was a great platform for whatever we all wanted to do. Now. I think you've been a bit unfair on yourself there. I mean, to step away from any role is a massive risk, but I think it takes a lot of principle, a lot of character and I think that's partially why the reaction you're getting now. You're not a man that takes flattery kindly, I can see that, but you know, we always have something to lose and to walk away from something that is a massive success mm. you've built. Everyone's looking at you going, he's a great lad. They're a great team. You know, you know yourself. It's not easy to re- replicate what you've done once, right? No, nor did I want to walk away. I saw that growth opportunity is another two or three years to now, how can I blow this out across multiple channels? Like, this is an insane opportunity, but I had to. Whatever little bit of integrity I have left in myself. And again, I, we're all human. We all make mistakes. Am I a Martha? Have I done silly things in my time? Of course I have. I've made huge mistakes with people and relationships. But whatever integrity I've left, I had to make a stand. And I made a commitment to my team at the time that I would take care of them, regardless of what happened. And I was able to shield and protect them for only so so long. Um, but again, I had nothing to lose because I knew I work-wise. And I, 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 I've grown with emotional intelligence compared to other people, I guess, that I still can compartmentalize it better that it's work and it's not life. And I've got a family, I've got three kids and I knew that I'll be okay if I have to get a job, which means I just work and get okay money to do it. I can do that for now in the interim, but I'll know I'll have no regrets. I'll know I'll be happier. I'll know I've done the right thing for a change. Mm. Um, so I knew it was important and I, and I could see that there was others who couldn't do it because they needed another year on their CV to maybe get them to where they wanted to be. They're saving for a mortgage and they need six months of pay slips to prove and get approval on a mortgage or whatever it is these days. They knew that they, oh, I've just had a young kid. I can't, I can't take the risk. Whereas I, 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 I was able to take a more calculated risk that whilst it's the right thing, I'll be okay. Mm. Um, so remember your team was impacted, you took a stand. What happened to the rest of your team? Uh, s- five or six of them have now resigned. They're all gone. Um, which is which is a shame, um, because they were a crazy bunch of individuals, and that's the great thing we had the ability to hire and identify the right people. I I was able to find like I didn't go through the traditional routes of of HR. I went and stalked people and said, "Do you want to work with us? I think you've got the right minerals to do what we need to do." How would you find them? Stalk them on the internet. What just great content they're putting out? Good attitude, content, on, on, creative on, on, copy. What 
tonally, like again, to accelerate things faster, if you can find somebody who can match the tone and style of what you're doing, that's half the battle. But then trying to find somebody who's just on the cusp of being really good at what they do and potentially come and become a creator and actually earn a living off it. So if identifying, finding one or two of those people to do that, who I needed for that side of that, always on creative all the time. Then hiring people who were good in the reactive sense. And then I also needed really solid people who were detail oriented and really great organizers and a little bit of strategic thinking at it. And bringing those together then because they all played to their strengths and they hated every minute out of the first. They're like, they were, they, they didn't understand why they were all there. They were all probably effing and blinding each other. What the fuck have I got myself Sounds in? Sounds intense. I mean, but it, 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 but we, we made it fun. But it, they, they, you could see how they get frustrated by the creative people being the worst organized human beings you'll ever meet. You know, then you have the detail oriented people who weren't helping the creative process and getting ideas out who aren't necessarily, but like they both educated each other in many ways, but they also eventually found out that they knew why they were there as part of a team. And when you see that moment click, it's gold. And when they all realize what they're there, the, the attitude, everything, it's all about the team, not about the individual. And it's absolute magic. And the, the, the fact that that's now broken apart, it's a little bit sad. I'm just going to say it is sad mm. because you create a, you've clearly thought about it so succinctly and train them it's like a sports team almost you've brought but this that, unique team together that's again I learned a lot from that sort of world um, but again I still caveat it with it guys I could come to you tomorrow and tell you you're sacked I could have to come and tell you your bad news you've been made redundant I could have to come and tell you that you're not performing the way I feel you need to perform but I always made that clear to them I said I'm going to build a good culture that's fun relentless curious and we will work fucking hard but remember, I'm your manager. And remember that at some point, I'm going to have to pull a rank or I'm going to have to make a decision. And that's business. And you've got to remember that. But I think that's refreshing because a lot of people do do it the other way. Oh, I'm your buddy. I'm your Fuck. pal. I'm this. I'm the other. And then it's, you know, crack and banter on Tuesday and P45 Wednesday. Yeah, it's not. I, found, I find a happy medium to do that. Even things like I, I won't go to Christmas parties. I go to team dinners and things like that. But God, that sounds great. I'm antisocial anyways. That'd be a uh, great excuse too, not to I go. Much, I much prefer, sorry, this sounds great for the pod, wiping my nose. Um, but I'm saying, like people think like, and even talking on these shows or doing presentations, geez, he looks like great crack. He's really fucking loud. He's obnoxious. He curses. He, but no, the last thing, like my social battery is fucking flat after a day's work. Nothing more I want to be sitting home with my wife having a glass of wine watching Netflix watching the series of Selling Sunset finished it last night exceptional <laughs> cringe TV <laughs> married at first sight Australia fucking love it mind numbing beautiful content to go life's not that shit when you've got dopes like that in the telly doing that sort of stuff <laughs> I'm the same I love this one to one uh, this fills me up going to a room 100 people completely gone I can't I won't engage I'll retreat I just can't find my way but this mm. This fills me up. But like you said, I said that someone last week, it was like, oh, my social battery's flat. I'm yeah. gone. But I'm even, out the gap. But, e but even in that room of hundreds of people on the floor, fucking hate it beside them. Put me on a stage. That's my, like, it's almost like a comfort blanket. Yeah. It means that I can I can be myself. But I I, I think it's a strength of mine. I, I always enjoy it. I, I love talking about what, I, it doesn't matter what I do. I love, I, I, I'm curious and relentless about anything that I do. And I do love what I've done over the last few years. And I'm, like, and what's, I love the creative side of things. There's nothing I love more talking about about how we made it work. Has it been weird? Have you, has it been uncomfortable last few months, last few weeks, not been able to do what you do? Um, I kind of have been though because I've been talking to so many people. Like the amount of calls I've been on in those three months, it, it almost felt like a full-time job. What were you doing? It was almost like I was consulting for free for fucking way too long. Um, I was just talking to businesses, looking at what my options are. Um, like people were reaching out to me on a daily basis. I was probably on minimum, or let's say an average of three to four hours of calls every day. Jesus. Of potential prospects and people, and either curiously want to know what the fuck happened, um, or wanting to work with me, or just wanting to understand how we did it. So again, I, I know the power of actually talking with people can help, and it helped build my reputation. It helped get context as to what the fuck happened and it also provided what we did it to help me navigate what next because there were a lot of options on the table and like what heads of social and other big brands and businesses and um, marketing agencies across Europe and uh, and the states coming off for me to take over departments offers to come move to Australia to work in big brands offers really? to go to the Middle East um, you know uh, and then People 
suggesting and advising I do my own thing. What was the weirdest offer you got? Um, working for a fairly big competitor airline in the Middle East with the most ridiculous um, financial offering um, known to man. Um, like They're just mad over there. They have so much money to spend, it's ridiculous. Not tempted? I was tempted, but convincing my wife and our three children to go over there, money talks, man. Um, <laughs> and I'm, this and is I, what the pocket money budget is going to be now, and this yeah. is what it'll be in the Middle East. And, or how about I go on my own? I'll actually hire a full-time replica of me, or maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe AI can make me or something. Look, if all the footballers are doing it, it kind of makes yeah. sense. It's become yeah. normalized. We, we tempted, though, seriously. That sounds unreal. Well, it sounds like a great opportunity, and like it, it would sound great as an experience for children, too, but... My wife's uh, mom and dad are, are quite elderly, uh, so moving right now is not an option, and we're there to support them. So I do, I'd say that we might get itchy feet in years to come where we can do it, but I think with the decisions I'm making about my, my role next, I think I can do that anyway. Like I, I can probably go and work a month in Spain or wherever it is, or the West Coast of Clare, um, and still do what I do. Why? Because now I make the decisions. So what are you gonna do? So look, after all the conversations, like most people um, were talking about consultancy and I even hate that word, but I guess it's the right thing. But you talked about the sports environment there a minute ago. I think it's more, I'm I'm almost becoming a coach. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done. And I'll give you an example. Let's go on a bit of a tangent again. When I do any kind of keynote speaking events, and I think I did it in, 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 in the, the event you attended as well, I always ask this question to the room, how many people have a documented or articulated strategy, at least on one page, that explains their why and what they're doing and how they're getting there? At max, and I've been, I did a keynote event with 800 people and a room with 100 people, no more than three people put their hand up in the room. And you're talking about big brands here who are in, in that space and in that room. Uh, and it screamed to me, okay, there's a lot of work that needs to be done here and actually social as a whole, mm -hmm. how it's being used because of all the, the pyramid scheme we've been set of content production all the time by agencies. Then there are the conversations I was having with people, how they were employing people. Like they're paying way too much money for heads of social that aren't really heads of social in, in its truest form. They don't sit at the leadership table. They're not making decisions. They can't have a voice in how to actually do it better. They sit under a header brand and they end up being this highly paid or overpaid community manager that does executional work. I was like, guys, you're wasting time and resource. That's not right. And then it's down to the process and plans. Like they're spending way too much money on agencies where they can find better ways to do it, more effective ways, especially if they want to live in certain worlds of social, like take reactive and the speed and pace that's needed in there to win. So all these things are, you know, again, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but not in the truest sense of a consultant coming in, just talking shit and walking out. So what I've developed is a positioning piece that's built around, let's call it a 12 month program. And in that, I'll help define businesses' strategy, their why. And I'll work with them in an accelerator framework to have on a piece of paper their why and a set of guiding principles to get there. It will eventually and every be simple in what it's communicated, but it needs to be so everybody buys into it, the business buys into it, and the team who delivers on it or the external partners do. I'll then look at, well, what's your team dynamic and how they're set up? Is your current team fit for purpose to deliver on that? Do they need to be rechanged, reorganized? Where's the gaps? Do we need to hire? Can you hire? What can we do with what headcount and resource you have? Help them make that, navigate that decision, find those people, because I think that's a skill that I have. I can find good talent to deliver on a specific type of strategy. Then it's, well, how do we actually deliver it? And the problem with a lot of consultancy or whatever advice is given, a strategy is only as good as its execution. And that's where most of it fails. And I don't want that. That's my reputation at the end of the line. And I don't want to be, oh, I could sell strategies for 10, 20 grand, whatever it is, hustle like the rest of them, but and let it fall flat and right off. But that's not gonna prove good work is good work. So what I want to do is I want to be able to roll up my sleeves. And I mentioned the head of social, the overinflated thing that mightn't be the right choice for the majority of business right now. But what you'll get with me then is essentially like a temporary lead. I'll roll up my sleeves and I come in as like a, a part-time leader. And that so is, fractional almost a fractional bingo head of I've state. heard that language been used yeah. recently I think it's an it's all the rage it's, it's all, all the rage. so hot right now so yeah. I'm, call yourself fractional I'm, I'm, you'll charge an extra 20% for that a fractional market share I'll just yeah but with that it allows them to get the experience the knowledge and the navigation of how to do the right thing find the right people and then put the processes and plans in place that's right for them mm. and by the time that's done after years period of time test learn adapt coach develop and those people that you hire at a midway level who are more executional they also then have a path they're being they're being coached by me 
they become your leaders when I run out the door and I hand over the keys and I ride off into the sunset and you should never want me again. Imagine somebody talking like you want to do work so well that you're no longer needed. But that's the role of a consultant. Like a, a good consultant should no longer be needed. If you're still around the business. That's the exact opposite of what consultants yeah. do. But anyway, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. They just make you so dependent. You're like the junkie coming but back from more. Like, so you can't get rid of them because you don't know what they do really, but you're afraid yeah. to plug it out. Even Amazon made a, an interesting series on it. That was fucking great. Um, but essentially, that's the offering on what I'm doing. Um, but is there an opportunity to grow after that? There is. And like when I looked at the options and looked at it, could I go and do it on my own? I could. But I'm really shit at certain things. And operating and organizing a business... Like you've had people on here like Pat Feed and, and Ray Ray Nolan, like fucking mad geniuses on how you fucking do this and like obsessive in knowing and building everything. It's a great word. Yeah, it is. You know, yeah. um, whilst I'm obsessive, I know and I'm very self aware of what I'm really, really bad at. And the thoughts of setting up a business is appealing, but you need to know everything about it. And I feel that that would take away from what I do know and what I'm good at. And going alone was probably the wrong thing to do. So with conversations, I was I was talking to a couple of old chums of mine in my old agency days, Dave Connor and, and Neve Hawley, who set up an agency called Frank and Bear right at the start of COVID, the mad feckers. Um, and they've kind of been navigating and growing that over recently. And they came to me with a really interesting proposition of how we do it. We set up a separate consultancy where you run, operate, it's your own thing. But then we have a sister agency where I can get the best set of Dave and Eve from business op, business growth, the the the, the setup and the, and the, the operating um, needs that they already have that they can help that I'm really, really shit at. But also they have paid performance and studio capabilities that if there's a time where all of these beautiful people I work with and fix their internals, I can help solve potentially as an option the external side, the execution side and time if that's needed. And then that creates something that is has a bigger picture that can grow more and essentially the consultancy uh, helps grow the other business so obviously there's a great kicker for them but there's a, a bigger kicker for me and there are two people I adore as well um, that's a win-win that's actually nice to hear people talk about a win-win like. oh completely but that's business and we all, uh, have, we all a lot of people don't yeah. say it that way but, but, but we all want to win and like again working alone can be quite lonely I imagine Um and that'd be tough, like especially in difficult situations. You can see how a lot of entrepreneurs struggle um, with mental health, with their physical health, because of they give it everything. Um, it's an addiction almost. You yeah, said an so, obsession, an addiction as well. Yeah. So at least going on the journey with a couple of people can be, make it a bit more fun and you can lean on them in better ways. So you're starting that right now? I'm starting that right now. So the, the consultancy is being called Frankly, uh, Frankly for a reason, because I want to be very unfiltered, direct and honest when it comes to how to use the platforms. Uh, I will come in as a, you know, a guide and won't hold back and make some honest assumptions and give you some honest clarity on how you need to be using the platforms better. And it's a sister company then to Frank and Bear. So obviously the language of the lettering from a branding side of things works well, but as an entity and a word of what I want to be, um, it rings true to who I am and my approach to how I work. Well, let's do a frank review of the platforms, right? Mm -hmm. Twitter, give me your two cents on each one. Again, it's hard. It's still going to survive. Like, again, it's... Uh, like X, sorry. Whatever X, you want to call it. Who cares what to call it? Like, we can call it pu Purple Monkey Dishwasher if we want. But, like, there's a time where it's probably going to fa fall and fall its way out. But, again, Musk can surprise us. Anybody could surprise us. They could have a re-emergence. So it's not dead until it's literally the, pull the plug is pulled. It's still a huge opportunity for many. And it's still a reference point for so many people to get breaking news and information. And it is that source. Treads could have been that. They had to go to market early. However, it's not available in Europe. Why the hell did they do it? Like, you know, is that, Treads is dead, right? Uh, no. Uh, yes and no. It's still being used, but it's been used by a lot of brands in a very branterish way. It's almost like that. Branterish. Oh, corporate brand. <laughs> I fucking hate it. When you see other brands engage with each other on the internet, that makes me fucking sick. They think it's great. It probably makes a great screenshot that goes in the PowerPoint in the weekly report. I think it worked above. once or twice, and then they all thought it was a great idea. Oh, but now they all do it all the fucking time, and it's just, it's just, it's cringe, and they think it works, but I'd say most of the genuine people they're trying to reach are ignoring every amount of it. But Treads has a potential, and there's a couple of reasons why it has a potential. It is the replica of Twitter. So as a functionality, it's almost there. The problem is that X is still alive. It's going to take whilst to migrate. 
it's also interesting that Treads is understanding how the creator-led economy is becoming even more important and how important that when you build a following, most social media platforms, if they go belly up overnight, which is the fear X or Twitter had, mm. you lose your audience. So imagine for Ryanair, almost 800,000 followers or more, I don't even know what the number is now. And overnight that goes to pot. You lose that, you've got to start again. So all the time and effort, money and resource you put into that, you lose it. So at least what I like about what Treads are doing is you can now get and people subscribe and get permission to take their email and you can bring that audience with you no matter where you go. So that's incredibly valuable. So I do see people will still invest. The problem on this side of the world is it's not available in Europe. What's the crack with that? Why isn't it still available? The GDPR I, thing? I, it could be. I don't know the ins and outs. We actually got early access to it. Like we uh, managed to use, <laughs> we used an app, uh, an AP, oh, was an APK, is that what they call the app bypassers? Oh, the VPNs. Yeah. Uh, well, it's not even that. I think it's like an APK thing where you can download. Oh, the it. developer tools. Yes. yes. To actually yeah, download yeah. it. Yeah. So we had it live for a week and we are actually doing some fun stuff until they, we uh, most people figured out and blocked all the accounts that did it. But I don't know. I think it's a policy issue. And it's gonna like that's to me that slowed down the score. I understood that they had to make a move, and like the US. Well, t- Twitter X was weak at its weakest. They C- need could we kill it here? We probably could. They had a massive spike, but then I think if you don't get that spark, though, I think if you don't get that, like, I think I think it'll have a, a like they'll figure it out. You think it'll be a resurgence? You think I, it'll come good? I think it will hundred percent be a resurgence. Okay. Its connection to Instagram, its ability to migrate the followers immediately was just a genius move. Okay, um, two cents on Instagram. Instagram, great. It's they're figuring it out. They're trying to cater. They they went too crazy down the route of video led and they lost its identity of what it was which is an image sharing platform it's such a big ecosystem that they have enough content and enough different feeds to cater to so many different needs of consumption so I think it'll survive it's actually getting better some of the policies they're bringing out the broadcast channels it's increasing its actual offering which makes it a great place to create and, and, and engage and deliver content so it's still a very rich space the problem is so many people are just using it incorrectly right TikTok TikTok, I think it's reached a saturation point right now. Like, again, people are going to struggle to win in that space. It's like this life cycle of a social media channel. Channels are set up, becomes this place. The startup at the time needs to find as many audience users to use the platform as quickly as possible. They need, they need, they need an audience base. Then they invite brands. We're going to give you all this lovely organic reach with all these people to in- encourage the brands to come across. Then they go, shit, we need to make money for our investors. So, okay, now we need to start doing advertising. Great. So now we've the audience. Now we've got the brands. Let's set up ads. Let's get money in. And we're going to penalize the, those brands reach now in order for them to actually start buying advertising. And now we start creating a cycle. TikTok is kind of at that moment. They're at the moment where they built the audience, became this beautiful space. They were giving free reach and moments of virality for so many brands and so many people. Then they brought in advertising. Now they're starting to penalize it. But also because it's, there's so many brands on. It's a bit like fucking podcasting. Everyone has a podcast now. And it's so saturated, it's difficult to win. Ouch. I know. I told you. No bullshit. I'm going to speak frankly. That it's difficult to cut through. So like now TikTok is becoming this space where it's an even greater challenge to win organically. Can you still? Yes. Won't you have an interesting angle, an interesting hook, know how to work the content, and but it's tough work. Most brands don't do it. They're trying to do what they do on Instagram and do on other channels and do it on TikTok and it's failing. Or they see a big green owl or a talking aeroplane and think that's how you win and they try to replicate it and fail. And it's become even more challenging for them. I think it's a great space. They're evolving good product there too from an e-commerce point of view. So as a platform and an entity, if you take the learnings from what they've done in China with um, with is it WeChat mm. and others? It's incredibly, incredibly strong. One thing I would call out as a bit of a Trojan horse, though, is CapCut. Now, again, no science to back this up. This is antidotal observation. CapCut is their editing CapCut app. CapCut is TikTok's editing app, but it's more than just an editing app. They've brought in so much of the functionality from TikTok where you can follow creators who make templates. You can comment on their content. You can engage and you can DM. So the functionality of TikTok is built into CapCut. They also have a pro option where you can pay for it to get access to better features on the actual product. So that's one way of generating revenue. So what is it? What is it the so Trojan Horse for? Trojan Horse for it's going to be another new social media app for a younger generation, your Gen Alphas. I hate using the terminology, but why do I observe? Parents of kids, and they know of TikTok, they're too young to use TikTok and they're too young to get internet access. But most young children have been given tablets from the age of four or five years of age up to the age of 10 now. But what parents are allowing them to do is to download CapCut. 
because they can use the filters, they can use the templates and make video content. But they are getting access to the internet at home through their broadband because they're playing other things. But they're all engaging, following, sharing their templates on CapCut. And to me, it's like it's almost like this transition that that's going to be a platform in itself for that younger generation of the future. And it's also going to be their, their en- entry into TikTok. So this is your Gary V esque prediction I, right here. Kind of. I, CapCut is going I to be the one. I might be talking absolute bullshit, but it's as, as uh, observing as a dad of three young children, a seven and an eight year old who are using CapCut with their friends, all they do is talk about that. The other thing they use a lot as well is, is Snapchat. And Snapchat That's is, still going. It's going to have, to me, is another research. Oh, but, wow. but not as a content creation platform. It's a d- direct response tool for young people. And even like Gen Z's. So users, communication? What do you mean? The messaging app or what? Like WhatsApp for them. Okay. And they're using the filters as a fun way to create content to engage with each other in DMs. Most kids are using it as they're using their parents' number that's connected to the account, but they're, they're contacting their friends who are parents. They're, they're, they say they're, they're friends' parents. And they're all using that. So it's Snapchat and CapCut, these two apps that have kind of been used for different ways are now being used for different means for different audiences. And this younger generation are naturally going to grow with that. So you could see a re- reemergence of Snapchat. But again, Snapchat for the last number of years has always been this DM chat for the Gen Z audience. WhatsApp's too uncool for them. They use Snapchat to DM for years and years. The younger generation are doing it too because the parents have control, kind of, but they're getting permission to contact their friends through that environment. And they're create, they're, there's features and functionality within it that is allowing them to make content. And CapCut's similar. There are two apps I weren't even going to ask you about. Now your favorite app, social media of all, LinkedIn. Hit me. Oh, LinkedIn is great, but it's just full of shit. And like, it's just corporate bollocks. Like, but again, like we, we, we chat about it. It has a huge reach potential if you find the right angle to do it. Um, but again, like take for example, Ryanair, I think I had 600,000 people following on LinkedIn, but we never scratched that. We, it was something we were going to look at at a moment in time, but it wasn't a priority on our list. But again, it's always an opportunity. It's a big space to play. Um, it will have its day. It will, like, again, saturate. Um, but right now it's a saturation of really shit, stupid updates and really shit carousels of the same regurgitated content all the bloody time. There's an opportunity to own and have an identity and build something quite strong for, for individuals and for businesses in that space. But everyone's just trying to be too professional there. I, I am delighted to announce X. I am delighted to announce Y. Oh, that's it. I'm, a, I'm delighted that I'm finishing my official last day of my current role and here's some home truths about it. Do you know what I hate, right? People are like, I just had such a fun time with the rock stars at Insert Tech Company. It's always a tech company. Insert Tech Company here. Mm. You're like, Michael, John, they fired you. Like, don't call them rock stars. No. There's so much, there's a lot of that. Of course there is. But again, people need to get past that. And it's a bit like most other channels, it's like Instagram. Instagram was this channel that it had to be perfect and polished. Now it's going through its evolution of, yes, it's a bit of that, but now they want real content and they're rewarding real authentic content. Do so you think Instagram's coming back? That'll be uh, your pick? Instagram never left. I think it's just, it, it's an incredibly powerful channel. To me, it's, it's a very strong channel for most people across any demographic, any category, any type of brand or business that they can maximize the most potential. TikTok also. Um, and then it's down to where your audience are. And then it's down to, well, do you have any money? Because if you're, depending on who you are, a small business, big business, your life cycle of your brand, your time and resource of people versus money has a huge influence on how you use the platforms. It depends, it depends, it depends, it depends. That will always be where I'll get to. And I'll give you an example. A, a, a friend of mine runs a um, kind of perfume company, but it's it's more around the, 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 the sanitization, but better quality premium products like that like hand sanitizers that smell absolutely delicious um, like your man Garen and you know, I'm delicious um, <laughs> but like she's like I want to do social but I see everybody documenting their story 24-7 day but I'm like but you make your product you can't Yeah. if you don't make the product you've nothing to sell you can't scale so you can't really be that type of person on the internet however if you try to pay for someone I'm not sure if that's the right role either But if you even have some sort of investment, well, there's a way that you can make really interesting creative about your brand and about converting people and use paid media, whatever amount you have, and still reach 100x of what you normally do and let it automate and actually use social in a way that's right for you right now based on your time, resource and budget and what you need. Because in your early stages, you need to sell product and you need people to be aware of it. So it always depends and it always goes, where are the audience? How can you do it? What brands do you like? What brands do you follow? And you're like, they're absolutely killing it. 
Oh, it's so or, hard. Or even creators, because I know you, you're very it, big in the creator it, economy. What creators it, are you watching? What brands are you watching? It's so hard. Like, um, again, do you like brands? Does anybody like a brand? I, I don't know. Uh, I, I always get asked this, and I always have fucking really shit answers. I love the Washington Post on social media. I think they've they've modernized the the media the approach to media and newscasting in the world of social in a very clever way. TikTok, they got their creators to explain that it's normally complex things in a way that was relatable to Gen Z. Um, other brands that do a really good job. That's symptomatic of the industry, though, if that's what that's, you're but, but again, it is. like Again, I love what I did because I did the right thing. Um, Gymshark. I, 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 think, I, think, Class. I think Gymshark is a brand, yeah. how they've evolved in new social is exceptional. Like Ben Francis in his early days didn't have a pot to piss in. He was a startup business. But he knew he had product. He put the product in the hands of people who were influential and he got people to wear it and he stimulated awareness. He stimulated trial. He Class started. story. And then he started to build it. They eventually used that and there was an integral part of building their community and building low cost, high return reach on social media. Use it very, very effectively with ambassador people over time. But then he exploded. Now he's worth a billion valuation. But they've now decided to, to, to do less of that and focus more on other methods of marketing because now they have the capital, the resource, the time and invest. So Why, why switch tactic? Do you have to? Do you reach a saturation point? Well, you probably do. And it's just based on time, resource and budget. It's not the most effective thing to do to reach scale. Okay. Now they're at a business where they have a switch on community. So they will nurture and develop a lot of that, but not at the level or the, the volume it needs to be. But now they need to reach far more low engaged users to sell more product. Okay. And there'll be an expectation and a scalability needed. And then you have to think about how you do that. Paid media is probably going to, based on your investment and your resource and your budget, probably going to reach far more people than one uh, that organic play can do. And then you've got to think about the behaviors and motivations of how they consume that media and the moments of purchase and the, all that. So it's, it's, it's too complex and it's too difficult to answer very simply what that is. So I love what Jim Shark do, but even on their TikTok, and I binged on their TikTok, I think about three or four weeks ago for 40 minutes. Um, because they found this angle of humor that they tapped into their audience so, so well in a way that is just so genius that it's starting to perform. I think they went through a period where they did really well, they saturated and then it dropped and they tried to find, but their team unearthed it and they, they, they tested and they learned, they found a way to deliver an angle around Jim Bro culture that created this really interesting dark humor that resonates with so many people within that audience that's just absolutely mind-blowing. Um, I think what they do on far other channels, their campaign, their responsive nature to what they do on the internet is exceptional. Um, I love them as a brand as well. I love the story, but I think they do really, really good work. Um, like There are a lot of brands that do okay work, but I feel they can do much better. Well, now they know how. I'm going to leave you with two questions. 2024, what social things are you looking at? What are you kind of like going, yeah, that could be a bigger, big one. I know you've kind of te you've teased it there with CapCut. What are you looking at? The biggest challenge, I think, is the is the audience ownership. Like, I think the whole X situation has scared the shit out of everybody that we're investing so much in building audiences that we don't own. The platformers own them. And if they turn off, we lose them all. So moving and owning audience is something to think about. And moving them to where? <clears throat> Wherever you need to go, wherever you need to own them, however you need to nurture them, you know, reach is really important in marketing. But like what these followers are, what you're doing is, is it becomes a concern. I don't like to me for now, <coughs> reach will always be the most important metric on social right now. But the concern is losing that audience overnight. So again, it's not 2024's conversation, but it's something that's on my mind. So email where? Email more than likely is the only one that I can see at the moment. And you're looking at other play ways where maybe the metaverse or wallets or whatever mm. it is, you can put them in and carry them. So yeah. it's, it's, it's too long a way. So it's not a big concern, but it's on my mind. 2024, um, I think it's just about delivering better work on the platforms. And I guess that's my focus uh, right now and what I want to do. And there's clearly a lot of work to clear up the bullshit because social media is not black and white. And if anybody tells you that there's only one way to do it, they're talking through their bloody arsehole and you need to stop following the snake oil merchants when it comes to that. There are so many ways to use the platforms that my focus for 2024 is to try and find as many businesses to make the best decision possible to have some sort of cultural impact, to educate their C-suite better at understanding the platforms. They, we all know the opportunity what social media channels can bring in terms of reaching people. But... It, there's multiple ways you can do that. And I want to go on the journey of 
trying to find people's why. And I know it sounds wafty and bullshit, but it's about making better decisions that have some sort of impact. Because if you're not, and you're doing next year the same thing every corporate brand is doing, and that is just becoming wallpaper and just a, a sea of sameness, it's the biggest waste of money. It's anymore. becoming like ads in the newspaper now. You don't even see them anymore. You're That's flicking through a magazine. You do not even see them. Your eyes just scan and, through. And there's big brands spending hundreds of thousands of euro every year on this. And, and they're, they're just dabbling and, and ticking a box and doing these. But it's like you say, everyone has a metric. Oh, did you hit the print metric? Yeah. Did you hit the yeah. Instagram metric? Yeah. So I want to fix people's shit is what essentially my focus for 2024. There's no real big dramatic change on the platforms. Okay. There's just, just doing, think about getting, 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 about getting more control, more getting more control, ownership and just getting and doing more better creative. work yeah. and, and making better decisions to actually use the chance to have impact or at least some form of culture. Final bit of advice to every... I know you love talking to founders. That's your passion. <laughs> Fucking founders. <laughs> <laughs> What's your bit of advice to any entrepreneur, business owner, someone who's just out there hustling? What's your final bit of advice to them? Oh, Jesus Christ, I don't know. Um, fuck, I'm not some sort of Steve Bartlett guru bullshit. So now again, I love love and hate Steve Bartlett. So don't get me wrong. Hi, Stephen. I'm meeting him next week. I'll tell him you pass on your regards. There, there you go. Look, it probably cost you 25 grand to go see him, but nonetheless, I uh, know I do love I'll him. I'll tell you after. I think what he's doing is great. But uh, any advice? I don't have advice. I Like, again, just don't be a dickhead. I think it's like the no dickheads rule. I think Toto Wolf did it on, a, on another podcast and he said the one rule and I love it. And I met another founder of a really great company that you should get on is the CEO of One Sonic. So oh, One Sonic is a new uh, headphone brand um, that is based in Ireland, created by an Irish guy who's a background in... Uh, I'll get you to intro me right after this. Audio engineering. He is an absolute genius. He's created an insane product and he's found this gap in the market where it's the barrier between the high performance audio equipment and the low range cheap shit you can buy on Amazon and he's created this amazing product for an affordable price and I feel if he gets the right backers it's going to absolutely explode but he added to that no dickheads rule so I'll build on that he said uh, to me and I fucking love it is it no dickheads and no fucking pussies and I know it's a bad language word to use but fuck it I don't care but I, the, the, what he's saying is correct you don't need to be a dickhead to be good in business but you also we, we have to have less snowflakes and that's the fear of the generations that are coming through. We need it to be a little bit more hardier and a little bit more resilient and a little bit more res relentless. And I think people are, are trying to go on one side of the line. Which are you? Which are you? But You don't have to be either. But it's you also... just be yourself. Uh, be sound. And there's a huge playground of and a, an amount of really good people that sit between both of those. Find those people. Play in that space. Don't be a dickhead, but don't be a pussy. Immense. That's not even mine. So there you go. David. Doesn't matter. Claim credit. No one's going to no, know. I'll edit out that. I'll, I'll send it to him and I'll let him know. <laughs> Michael, where can people learn a bit more about you and Frankly? Well, you can go to the professional site, LinkedIn. Um, I'm currently working on the branding and the setup, but uh, I'll have a, a, a website set up soon. So it'll be a bit of a landing page to explain what I've done, where to contact me and join my waiting list um, because I've got lots of lots of work. Uh, but find me on LinkedIn, search Michael Cork and find me on Twitter X at Le Machine. Long story why I'm called at Le Machine. That's a college nickname. We don't need to go there. Uh, <laughs> um, but M Michael, uh, that was savage. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Made it all the way to the end. Click here to subscribe to the channel. Click here to listen to last week's interview. We do these interviews every single week. So hit subscribe. I'll see you in a few days.